Greetings, this is Greg, P47 Thunderbolt Part 1. In this video, we'll go over the basic design of the P47, its turbo supercharging system, and top speeds at various altitudes as compared with other fighters. If you haven't seen this channel's videos on manifold pressure and turbo versus supercharging in World War II aircraft, you might want to watch those first. Links are in the description. Now nothing about the P-47's design was revolutionary. Its three major features were the big Pratt & Whitney R2800 engine, the turbo supercharging system, and the Seversky wing. All of these things had been used individually on other planes before. The R2800 was used a year earlier on the Corsair, and the previous design from Republic, the P-43 Lancer, had used a smaller air-cooled radial engine with a turbo supercharger and a similar wing. Thus, the P-47 represented an evolutionary step. A big step, but not one that was revolutionary, and this isn't a criticism. I think it's part of the reason the plane works so well. It wasn't as revolutionary as other attempts at building a modern turbocharged fighter, for example, the P-38 or P-39. The P-47's designer, Alexander Cartvelli, packed it with technology, but only with proven technology. In the era when World War II planes were developed, manufacturers chose existing engines and designed planes around them. They normally chose between one of two major engine types, the air-cooled radial or the liquid-cooled V-12. As technology advanced, each type would gain advantage over the other and they would leapfrog each other. As explained in my previous video, in 1926, the development of ethylene glycol tilted the advantage towards the V-types. Then, in 1932, Pratt & Whitney released the R1830 air-cooled engine. The R stands for radial, and the 1830 is the engine's nominal displacement in cubic inches. It works out to just under 30 liters. What's important here is that this engine had its 14 cylinders arranged in two rows of seven. That matters, because by using two rows of cylinders, the displacement of the engine could be about double that of an equivalent single row, but with no significant increase in frontal area. In other words, the 1830 had about the frontal area of a 900 cubic inch engine, but with twice the power. Most of the major radial engine fighters of World War II used engines with this multi-row design. There are, of course, some exceptions. Uh, for example, Curtis Wright managed to get 1,820 cubic inches into an engine with almost the same frontal area by squeezing nine cylinders into one row. Still, generally speaking, the more rows a radial engine has, the better its power to frontal area ratio gets. And it turns out that with two rows, the V-type's advantage is reduced just enough to make the radials justifiable in some cases. Now, the R1830 was not the first twin-row radial, but earlier twin-row radials suffered from cooling problems, which had been mitigated with improvements in engines and cowling design. Now, at this point in history, the V-type is still superior on paper, but it's still 1932, and the R1830 is ready for action. The new V12 Allison wasn't quite ready for production, Thus, the R-1830 was chosen for a number of military airplanes. In the mid to late 1930s, several designers used this engine for their aircraft. Uh, these aircraft include the P-36 Hawk with its 1,050 horsepower R-1830 with a single-stage supercharger. It entered service in 1938, and although its performance would have been considered pretty good when it first flew in 1935, by 1938 it was pretty much obsolete. The Navy's F-4F Wildcat used this engine with a two-stage supercharger, and it had decent performance at low and medium altitudes. In 1940 and 41, until the advent of the P-38 Lightning, the only U.S. fighter in operation that was capable of fighting at high altitude was the Republic P-43 Lancer, which also used the R-1830. The Lancer was not a stellar airplane. It lacked self-sealing tanks, it didn't have armor, it had some technical issues, but it proved the effectiveness of the Seversky wing and the practicality of using a turbo supercharger in a fighter. In 
The P-43, along with the P-36, F-4F Wildcat, and some others, allowed for quite a bit of development in radial engine fighters. A lot of this development was in improving the engine cowlings, and cowlings were a huge area of focus for NACA. There are so many reports on engine cowlings, I couldn't really possibly go through them all in, in a video. In this report here, they tested eight radial engine cowlings and found that due to compressibility, which is an issue I'll be covering a lot more in part two, drag would increase massively above a certain speed. With the best cowling they could come up with at the time, they found there was a practical limit of about 480 miles per hour at low altitude and about 430 miles per hour up high. Thankfully, for the designers of the P-47, this report was in 1939, which gave some time for further developments and improvements. Another issue was cooling. Cooling and drag are closely related, but NACA did a lot of work to figure out how to reduce drag while still getting enough cooling. I'm going to use pictures from a later report using the P-47 itself, but earlier reports were done in largely the same way. NACA would put a pressure sensor in front of and behind each cylinder and measure the difference. That would tell them how much airflow was getting to each cylinder, and then they would make changes to the cowling accordingly. In 1940, NACA started testing a large number of military airplanes to evaluate drag and try and reduce it. The results of that test were released in October of that year, and we're going to go through it. This is a pretty important test. For some reason, they didn't have a P-43, but they did have a P-35, which is an earlier aircraft which also has the Seversky wing. Now, the P-35 was one of the oldest planes in this test, thus it has a little bit older version of the wing, but it's still generally the same design. Now, here are the results of the test. For some reason, they did not name a single airplane involved. They assigned them numbers 1 through 11. You can see the total drag for each plane in its original condition here. Now, of course, I took the trouble to figure out what each, what each airplane was. It wasn't too hard since they had pictures of each plane in the full-scale wind tunnel, plus line drawings and specs for each, so here you go. Notice the old P-35 does pretty well here. We'll come back to it. The biggest surprise for me was the Vought Vindicator. The Vindicator is a radial engine dive bomber from 1937. Looking at it, we can see its family resemblance to the Corsair. It has the closely cowled engine, a very similar wing design of the inverted gull type, and the leading edge of the horizontal stab is a bit forward. Clearly a family resemblance. Airplane 11 is probably an early version of the Curtis XP-46. That wing is unmistakably a Curtis design, but it's still quite different from the actual XP-46 that flew, so that's really my best guess. Anyway, back to our diagram. Notice how high the P-39's drag is. The only planes worse were the Brewster Buffalo and the Grumman biplane. That's because the turbocharged version of the P-39 had serious cooling issues, and to try and solve them, Bell had to introduce some large drag-inducing air scoops. So those numbers are not representative of a production non-turbo P-39. Not shown on this chart is that the P-35 had the lowest wing drag of all. It's shown in another part of the report. But I find that impressive because it's the second oldest plane in this test and the oldest monoplane. That really says a lot about the Seversky wing. The fuselage was another matter. NACA found a lot of ways to clean up the fuselage. As an example, this is the approved oil cooler. Now, I don't have a direct source telling me that Republic read this study and factored what was learned into the P-47 design, but I have to think that they did, and for two good reasons. One, if NACA does a study in your airplane and competitors' airplanes involved, I think any designer that takes his work seriously is going to read it. Second, a lot of the improvements made to the planes in this test were seen on the P-47 including improvements to the gun installation, cockpit canopy, various intake and exhaust ports, and oh, the P-47 has a lot of intake and exhaust ports, as we'll see. Additionally, the P-39 uses the same sort of turbo supercharger installation as the Republic P-43 Lancer, as well as the P-38, B-17, and B-24, which, as seen in this report, causes a lot of drag. 
This older type of turbo installation exposed the turbo to the airflow for cooling, but it just wasn't efficient. The P47's turbo is configured exactly the way NACA suggested in this report. This report came out in late 1940. The P47, as we know it, first flew in May of 1941. So I think they had enough time to implement the lessons learned here, and I think that's exactly what they did. So at this point, we can see that everything was starting to come together for the P-47. Republic Aircraft, formerly Seversky Aircraft, had experience with turbo supercharging, and they had an excellent wing. Progress had been made in improving cowlings and engine cooling due to the popularity of the R-1830. And now, in May of 1940, the new Pratt & Whitney R-2800 engine just made its first flight in Vought's F-4U Corsair. Add in the fact that NACA had recently shown how to clean up the drag on Republic's fuselage and turbo system, and all the pieces are in place for the P-47 to come together. Now, before we get to the plane itself, I want to mention that we're, when we're talking about the P-47 Thunderbolt, we're talking about the P-47B and subsequent models. There was a Republic XP, X is experimental, XP-47A, it's seen here. But that's an entirely different airplane, which was never produced, and it was abandoned in favor of the XP-47B, which is the plane that became the P-47 as we know it. Now, why did Republic abandon the XP-47A in favor of the B? I don't know. They certainly didn't uh, publish, publish that in public information. But they did have some problems with the A. Now, that's normal in the early stages of development of almost any plane from this era. My suspicion is that they knew they would be pressed for time, so going with a design that was more familiar to them, a radial engine plane with a Seversky wing, was just more comfortable and they knew it would work. The A model was going to require a lot more development and maybe for nothing. The radial engine, turbo, and Seversky wing were all known quantities and of course war was coming. Enough about the background. Let's look at a production P-47 and go over some of the features. I think the best way to do that is to start with the outside and then look under the sheet metal. We'll start at the front. Notice the shape of the cowling is larger at the bottom than would be needed to simply enclose the engine. Republic decided to keep all the ducting and coolers in the fuselage, hence the extra size in the vertical dimension. The cowling is a NACA design. Now below the engine and you can see the main duct here and it's immediately divided into three sections. The two outboard sections provide air to the oil coolers. The larger center section of the duct provides air to the inner cooler, cooling for the turbo, and ram air to the turbo supercharger's inlet. Airflow through the oil coolers is regulated by the pilot via two electronically controlled shutters which are operated by a single switch shown here as item 11. The indicator for the shutter position is seen here as item 4. I should note this isn't always controlled by the pilot. The later models had an automatic position uh, so that if the pilot did not want to manually control the shutters, they could control themselves automatically, and I have no idea how well that function worked. Now, the more the shutters are open, the higher the drag, but the greater the cooling. Operationally, they should be set to neutral for engine start. On the ground, they're normally left in neutral except in very cold weather where they would often be closed to help the engine warm up faster. Once airborne, they're positioned to allow for an oil temperature of about 95 centigrade, 203 Fahrenheit. In practical terms, that means as soon as you're in cruise at high altitude, they'll usually be mostly closed. Managing drag is important in the P-47 and if it's not done correctly, performance will suffer. In this picture, you can see the left side oil control shutter. Of course, there's one on the other side as well. Just behind the shutter, or I should say after the shutter, is one of two wastegate exits for engine exhaust. There's one on each side, and when the turbo is not in use, exhaust exits here. As more and more demand is put on the turbo, those gates close up more and more and direct an increasing amount of exhaust to the turbine. In other words, the pilot regulates manifold pressure largely by controlling the position of these wastegates. The large flaps that go around the rear of the cowling are called cowl flaps. 
These hydraulically operated flaps regulate cooling airflow to the engine. When open, they cause a lot of drag. Now typically at low speeds and high power, they're going to need to be fully open. That means they'll be fully open for takeoff. Uh, and after takeoff, they're going to be manipulated with a push-pull knob located on the right side of the instrument panel, about position 35 seen here. That is a position 35 seen here. And the idea is to keep the cylinder head temperature gauge, which is seen in position 33, at 260 centigrade or 500 degrees Fahrenheit or a little bit below. Now the cowl flap control allows for settings fully open, fully closed, or anywhere in between. They cause a lot of drag when open, and if cylinder head temps get too hot or too cold, performance and engine life will suffer. So cowl flap management is very important in the P47. On this plane, we can see the right side intercooler door. There are two, one on each side. The switch and position indicator in the cockpit are of the same type and located next to those for the oil cooler doors. Again, in later models, there's an automatic position. Now, the shutters need to be open enough to maintain a temperature on the carb air temperature gauge below 35 centigrade, 95 Fahrenheit, or the threat of detonation will require manifold pressure to be reduced to 42 inches, costing the plane 375 horsepower or more, depending on the model. So I'll just say that again. Uh, you need to regulate the temperature to keep it below, to keep the carb air temp below 95 degrees Fahrenheit, or performance will suffer massively. Now, between the management of the oil cooler doors, cowl flaps, and intercooler shutters, a lot of things have to be set correctly to get maximum performance out of the engine with a minimal amount of drag. As a general rule for maximum performance in the P47, all of these things should be wide open in a low speed climb or during low to medium speed maneuvering, especially at lower altitudes. For maximum speed at high altitude, you would configure with cowl flaps closed and the oil cooler doors and intercooler shutters in neutral. And you might be able to fine tune them watching your gauges to get uh, squeak a little bit more speed out of your airplane. Now you might wonder why would you ever close the intercooler doors? Well there are two situations when you might want to do that. It's possible, although incredibly unlikely, that you would have to close them to eliminate carburetor icing. That's not really a factor in the P-47, but it's mentioned in the manual as a remote possibility. Secondly, if you're in cruise and not using much turbo boost, or not using turbo boost at all, in other words, you're running fairly low manifold pressure, you might be able to close them all the way to reduce drag while maintaining an acceptable carb temperature. Some modern cars do this as well. Certain Maseratis, for example, will shut off airflow to the intercooler for reduced drag and increased fuel efficiency. Notice the WW on the tail of this plane, and here's another one. WW stands for War Weary. These are planes that are still flyable, but deemed too worn out for combat. Usually their older versions no longer favored. They were used for search and rescue and carried a belly tank, and typically two droppable self-inflating life rafts and smoke bombs under the wings. The P-47 was a good plane for this role. It was fast, so it could search a large area. It would then drop life rafts and stay on station until a rescue plane or a boat arrived, all while having enough performance and firepower to defend itself or others if trouble showed up. Back to our technical subjects, it's time to look under the sheet metal. The right side of the picture is the front of the airplane, so you've got to kind of get oriented here and the main air intake scoop is at position one. This scoop is at the bottom of the cowling, as we know. At position two, you can see that we have the oil cooler doors we talked about earlier, often called shutters. The waste gates are at position four. They're controlled by the regulators for them at position three. The dual exhaust pipes, called exhaust stacks, at position five, run all the way back to the turbo supercharger at position 17. The exhaust then exits through the exhaust hood under the fuselage at position 16. That takes care of the exhaust side of things, at least the engine exhaust side. Now, the air that entered at position 1 and didn't go to the oil coolers 
eventually branches off at a location you can't see in this picture, but it's just forward of the intercooler at position 8. The upper portion of the air flows through the intercooler to lower the temperature of the turbocharger's discharged air. The air then exits the intercooler through the discharged ducts and intercooler shutters at spot 11. The Thunderbolt's intercooler is huge. In the English language, the prefix inter means between. It's called an intercooler because it's located between the turbo supercharger and the mechanically driven supercharger. And it cools the charge air. In World War II airplanes, charge coolers located after the last stage of supercharging are called aftercoolers. Eventually, in automotive terminology, the word intercooler evolved to mean essentially any charge cooler, regardless of location. But technically, most cars have aftercoolers and not intercoolers. Intercooling does two main things for us. It increases the charge air density by cooling it, and it lowers the temperatures to help inhibit knock, thus allowing for more boost. It's often compared with water injection, but these are two different things. An intercooler or aftercooler gives a relatively large increase in air density and relatively little anti-knock protection. Water injection is the opposite. It gives relatively little increase in density, but a lot of anti-knock protection, which is why so many World War II airplanes use both. Most U.S. designated, correction, most U.S. designed engines did not use aftercoolers. They ran relatively low boost from the first stage supercharger and didn't really need them. However, they typically used intercoolers for the higher boost from the second stage. Back to our diagram, there are two other branches of air. There's a big lower branch that provides ram air to the turbocharger's compressor inlet at position 14 and a very small branch at position 10 used for cooling the turbo through a shroud at position 15. This cooling is part of the reason the P47 is not, its turbo is not exposed to the airflow as it is in most of the other turbocharged US airplanes. NACA found that a lot of drag could be saved this way. Air exits the turbo through the duct at position 12, passes through the intercooler, is cooled and then through the pipes at 18 to the injection carburetor. We'll finish out this diagram with 6, 7, and 9 which are the oil supply tank for the turbocharger, the vent line for the tank, and the oil lines for the turbo. At 13 we have the exhaust into the turbine section. There were many models of the P47 that saw combat. There's the B, C, D, G, M, and N, and there are multiple sub-variants for each model. There were only 171 of the earlier B models built, so we can sort of discount those. The C and G were essentially the same airplane, just built in different factories, and production of these two models only amounted to 956 airplanes. When you're talking about the P-47 that saw combat in World War II, you are normally going to be talking about the D model, as over 12,000 were built, which represents the vast majority of P-47s. It's time to look at the speed of the P-47, but which P-47 are we going to look at? Well, as I mentioned, the D model was built in the greatest numbers, and it served from 1942 until the end of the war. So I think it's the logical choice here, but which D model? There are 28 different variants of the D models, and each one of those can use one of six different propellers. Now the next problem is that some of the needed data is a bit scarce. There were plenty of tests on the P-47, but trying to find a specific test with a specific fuel and propeller in a specific configuration with all the data I want is a bit of a problem. Either the test plane has bomb racks installed, fuel that wasn't available until mid-1944, or it doesn't have the full range of altitudes we need to look at, uh, or something. And then you multiply these problems by the five airplanes we want to look at because we have to have some comparisons. And compromises are going to have to be made. It's impossible to come up with data for perfect comparisons. Hopefully you're happy with what I did here, and if not, uh, you just have to deal with it. For the P-47 data, 
I settled on a D5 model. It's a water injected version running 58 inches of manifold pressure at war emergency power, no bomb racks. It's running a 12.2 inch Curtis propeller of which there were three versions and I don't know which of those three was on this plane but they're all pretty similar anyway. I was also missing data points for this plane at sea level and at 34,000 feet so I took the sea level data from a plane tested at 65 inches of manifold pressure but with no water injection and with bomb racks. Its performance was identical at 5,000 feet so it made sense to use that data for the sea level numbers. For the data at 34,000 feet I had to take the data from another chart and interpret the data back to account for lack of the bomb racks. I'm pretty happy with uh, the numbers I came up with. I think that they're extremely accurate and all of the other numbers that are going to be shown here are directly off of a official chart from the wartime. For comparison I wanted to add in four airplanes. A Spitfire Mark 9 from 1943 was my first choice. However, I had to settle on a Mark 9 from early 1943 running about 60 inches of manifold pressure. So a little bit more manifold pressure than the, than the Thunderbolt. I included the P-51A. Based on comments in my other videos, it appears that a lot of people underrate the Allison-powered P-51. The P-51A is actually a really good airplane at low to medium altitudes. Finding a test on the XP-51A, the early prototype, is pretty easy. Finding a test on a standard P-51A at war emergency power is more difficult. The only test I could find with complete data used a plane that was a production airplane but had a few mods to make it faster. Mainly they sanded down the paint with 400 grit sandpaper. Uh, if you don't deal with sandpaper, take my word for it. 400 grit is really fine so they made that plane super smooth. And they also used tape to tape over a few uh, things that they thought were increasing drag a little bit. So nothing that somebody couldn't have done at the front lines but not truly a, a plane fresh off the production line either. Now of course I had to put in a P-51B with the Merlin engine. The P-51B did make it into combat in 1943, but it was pretty late compared with the other planes here. Last, I decided to include an FW-190A5 running C3 fuel, which was the best the Germans had at the time. So this is about the best conceivable 190 a Thunderbolt could run into. The one at that time. The 190 was a low and medium altitude fighter, but I've used BF-109 so much on this channel already, I wanted a change of pace. Plus, I happen to be working on a 190 video, so it fits into my plan. All of these airplanes flew and fought in 1943. Some are high altitude planes and some are low altitude planes. But the P-47s did have to fight down low sometimes, and the FW-190s certainly had to fight up high because the American bombers were coming in at 25,000 feet. So these comparisons are relevant. At the end of this video, I'll put up the actual reports I took the data from. There's some room for about a two to three mile per hour error just from the rough conditions of some of the graphs. I'll also put up a complaint form. So if you feel your favorite plane has been treated unfairly, you can let me know by filling it out and sending it in. Now let's start with the low altitude data. As you can see down low, the P-47 does not exactly set the world on fire, but it's not slow either. The FW-190 poses a serious threat to the P-47 in this realm, partially because it's faster. The Spitfire Mark 9 isn't looking too good right now, but it will get better as it climbs. The Allison-powered P-51 really does well down here. Now, as I said earlier, this is a slightly modified airplane, so I think those numbers are a bit high, probably about 10 miles per hour high. But still, the P-51A is fast at these altitudes. The Allison puts out a lot of power down low, and the plane is very slick. The Merlin-powered P-51B does well here, and it does well at all altitudes, as we'll see. In terms of top speed, the P-51's aerodynamics just serve it very, very well. Now let's look at the medium altitudes. The P-47 catches up to the Allison-powered P-51 and FW-190. Now 20,000 feet is right about where this version of the 190 maxes out its supercharger stage, which is why it's doing pretty well there. The Spitfire finally catches up with the P-51A, but again, I need to stress this is an early Mark 9 against an abnormally fast 51A. In most cases, the Mark 9 would have probably caught up by about 15,000 feet. But still, the 51A is faster than most people think, 
For what it's worth, Wikipedia shows a top speed for the P-51A of 409 miles per hour at 10,000 feet. Now, I'm not sure what their source was, but it may have been the same one that I used. Now, let's look at the high altitude numbers. The P-47 could fly at 30,000 feet or higher, and it typically would fly at 30,000 feet while escorting U.S. bombers, which were flying at 25,000. At that altitude, 30,000, it's 59 miles per hour faster than the 190. At this altitude in 1943, only the P-51B can outrun a P-47, but the P-47 has other advantages which we'll eventually get to. Now, of course, it's possible to use different planes or different versions for comparison. I get that. And I'm sure we'll be getting comments that point that out. But no comparison of World War II fighters is a perfect apples-to-apples -apples case. We can always pick a faster version of our favorite plane or a slower version of some other airplane. However, if we play that game, the P-47 wins because with 70 inches of manifold pressure, the P-47D would run 444 miles per hour with bomb racks installed. In fact, this exact airplane in this picture did that. Furthermore, the P-47M, which came out later in the war, could do 473 miles per hour, making it the fastest Allied piston engine fighter to see combat in World War II. It's very likely that some P-47s in the field could easily exceed their published maximum speeds, now, I know this is pretty controversial, and I'm not usually one to buy into things like this, but I think it's true in the case of the P-47. It's pretty easy to adjust the turbo supercharging system so it puts out more boost, and there's room to do it because Republic didn't build these planes with all the components right on the ragged edge of self-destruction. U.S. ace Robert S. Johnson claimed in an interview that factory tech reps showed his crew chief, Pappy Gould, how to adjust the wastegates to provide higher than standard manifold pressure. His P-47 was a D-5 with water injection and was apparently set to run 72 inches. This plane had some further special attention via sanding and waxing. First of all, let's talk about the 72 inches of manifold pressure. A lot of people dispute this, but is it a reasonable claim? I think so. A standard P-47D-5 would run 58 inches of manifold pressure, giving it 2,300 horsepower, and could hold that up to a maximum altitude of 25,000 feet in the standard atmosphere. With 130 octane fuel, it was able to run 64 inches. However, by mid-1944, P-47s were regularly running 70 inches with 150 octane fuel and water injection, and the later M and N models both ran at 72. Now, these later planes were slightly different versions with slightly different engines than the R-2800-21 in Johnson's plane, but not much different. Also, Johnson didn't say exactly when his plane was modded, but I suspect it was at a time when 130 octane fuel was available. So going from 64 inches to 72 seems quite reasonable, especially since his plane was apparently well cared for and he probably took extra care to avoid knock by monitoring his carbon cylinder head temperatures. He started flying at the age of 14 and in Oklahoma where in the summer knock is a problem. So it's safe to say he was a highly experienced pilot by World War II fighter pilot standards. So how fast did he say his plane was? He made two specific statements about this. He said that he flew all the versions of the P-47 including the M and that his personal D-5 was the best one. He goes on to say that he saw 300 miles per hour indicated at around 32,000 feet, and he figures that was around 470 miles per hour of true airspeed. That is a big statement. Looking at this objectively, I have to consider all the variables and see how they stack up. I completely buy the 72 inches of manifold pressure. No problem there. He never says how high the plane could go and still get 72 inches, but that is the real question. Could it maintain that up to 32,000 feet, which is what it would need to do to have the speed he's claiming? Now we know that the later D models could hold 70 until just over 23,000 RPM. That limitation was due to, the altitude limitation that is, was due to the turbocharger's maximum speed of 18,250 RPM, which is actually pretty low for a turbo. I'll have to assume 
that if the factory reps taught Pappy Gould, his crew chief, how to increase manifold pressure, they also taught him how to increase the maximum turbine speed without blowing things up. I have seen one reference saying that this turbo had been run up to 21,300 RPM in the XP-47B. The factory reps would have known that, and in fact, you'd really have to increase the maximum turbine shaft speed because if you can't maintain that higher manifold pressure up to higher altitudes where the plane's actually going to fight, what's the point? So I, I think logically, we have to conclude that they did and could increase the maximum shaft speed of the turbo. Now the later M and N models had different turbos. They had maximum speeds of 22,000 RPM, 20% higher than the D. That extra 20% is the primary reason the later airplanes were able to hold that manifold pressure until 32,000 as opposed to 23,000 for the older airplanes. Now the D and M models have the same wing but different fuselages. We know that Johnson's plane was cleaned up, didn't have bomb racks. Individual planes vary, but it sounds like this was the best possible D5 with the very best care. If it could have oversped its turbo by 20%, I think it would have had the same power and speed of a P47M, which could do a little over 470 at 32,000 feet. Is that 20% overspeed possible? I think so, but it's tough to say. It's common to have engines with 5,000 RPM red lines hit 6,000 RPM and not blow up. That's 20%. Of course, the forces are different in an engine than a turbo. It's common for turbos, though, in an automotive applications designed for maximum speeds of 180,000 RPM to hit 220. In fact, it's done all the time. Obviously, I don't have an ancient GE turbo here to test to destruction, but I'm willing to take Robert S. Johnson's word on it since all the facts he provided seem to add up to the extent that I can check them, meaning that the engine could handle that manifold pressure if knock was avoided. The turbo uh, could be spun up fast enough, in fact had been spun up fast enough in testing, to maintain that manifold pressure up to very high altitude, at least 30,000 if not 32. And those numbers on a good P-47 would give about that speed. But one more thing, he said that he saw 300 miles per hour indicated, which he determined is around 470 miles per hour true. His math checks out if it was about 20 degrees colder than standard on that day, 20 degrees centigrade. That is really, really cold, but not impossibly cold. And we are talking about Germany in the winter during World War II. It was not a pleasant place, especially at altitude. So uh, if you don't understand the difference between indicated airspeed and true airspeed, don't worry about it too much, just wait. I will cover it when we get into maximum dive speeds in part two. That's a big part of that video and a big part of the P-47. So let's summarize. The P-47 came out in late 1942 and flew through the end of the war. For most of that period, with the exception of the Merlin-powered P-51s, the P-47D was the fastest piston-powered plane at high altitude over Europe. At 70 inches of manifold pressure, a D with wing racks could do 444 miles per hour. There are a small number of German planes which were faster, but by the time they showed up, around that time the P-47M came out, which could reach 473 miles per hour at 32,000 feet. No VF-109 variant was anywhere near that fast, nor were any FW-190s. A case can be made for the TA-152 if it's spraying nitrous and at a high enough altitude. And maybe the Dornier 335, but I don't think it could do it at those altitudes. Both of those planes were built in incredibly low numbers, probably only a few dozen. And as far as I know, neither one encountered a P-47. At least I couldn't find evidence of that. I think it's reasonable to think that there were at least some P-47Ds that could do at least 450 to 460 miles per hour. I doubt Robert S. Johnson's was the only one that was modified. Even if you don't believe his claim of 470, you almost have to believe, say, 455, since they went 444 with wing racks and slightly less manifold pressure in official testing. 455 is still really fast. Similar claims about modifications of other airplanes like 109s or Spitfires might be true, but I don't think so. Increasing the boost from a gear-driven supercharger is much more involved 
at least above the aircraft, the supercharger's critical altitude. So I don't find many of these stories as believable. My wife just bought me a new computer, so I plan to get some World War II flight sims. I'm excited to see how accurate these newer sims are. Historically, flight sims tend to have P-47s that underperform, with performance specs from the versions that only ran 52 or 58 inches of manifold pressure. I'm not sure why that is, because for the last 12 months of the war, they ran 70 or 72 inches. That is clearly documented. They will often have top performing versions of German planes and of Spitfires that were very rare, but not the P-47 which at 70 inches, which was very common. At least the older Sims were that way. Uh, I'll see how the new ones are. Now the P-47s that were sent to Europe were typically shipped in crates. Most of it was pre-assembled. It was sort of like an almost ready to fly radio control airplane, except a real airplane. Uh, the major pieces needed to be put together, of course, once it reached England. Now, no special tools or equipment were required. It could be done by a team of 50 people uh, with nothing but hand tools and a shovel, and usually only one guy that really knew, knew what was going on. So you and 49 of your friends could put together a P-47 should you come across such a kit. The entire crate would come apart and be stacked in such a way as to form the platform the plane was assembled on. They would put it together dig holes below the wheels, hence the need for the shovel. And then they could extend the gear. Once the things had connect, once they had everything connected, they could release the fuselage from its mounts, compress the gear, fill the holes in the earth, well, maybe not all quite in that order, and then roll the plane forward to finish the assembly. England at that time had a lot of craftsmen and people familiar with mechanical things. So getting teams of civilians to do this was fairly common, and apparently it was pretty easy. I think it was clever of Republic to design the plane so it could be assembled in this way. Of course, in the Pacific, it was another matter. In many cases, the planes had to be shipped ready to fight. Finding a team of civilians with enough mechanical skill to assemble a P-47 on some remote Pacific island wasn't an option. The decision was made to send them on ships fully assembled, ready to fly. One type of ship chosen was the escort carrier. These ships were only 512 feet long. They're so short that the Corsairs and Hellcats couldn't effectively operate from them, which is why they used Wildcats until the end of the war, something I touch on in another video. Getting P-47s onto ships would be relatively easy. The U.S. Navy is really good at using cranes. Getting them off was the issue. Even with the carrier at its maximum forward speed to give the Thunderbolt about a 20 mile per hour headwind, it would still require a 1300 foot takeoff roll, and that was if it was very lightly loaded. With a total length of 512 feet of ship, and a lot of that was used up by parked airplanes because you couldn't get a P-47 uh, below the flight deck. So, as you'd imagine, the uh, takeoff roll required was going to be a problem. However, Many of these tiny carriers had catapults, maybe all of them, I, I don't know about that, but the ones that carried P-47s had catapults. Someone decided that it should be possible to catapult a lightly loaded P-47 off of an escort carrier. They were correct, but just barely. It's very clear in the few videos of this that the 47s were just barely able to maintain flying speed, but as far as I know, they all made it. One escort carrier, this is a particularly famous incident, uh, escort carrier USS Manila Bay came under attack by Vol dive bombers with its deck packed with P-47s. You can even see a bomb in this picture before it hits the water. Four Thunderbolt pilots took to their planes and launched, all with success. Now if you're a Vol pilot and a P-47 is coming after you, you are having a really bad day. So once the P-47s were in the air, the Vols were long gone. So the four Thunderbolts flew combat air patrol until naval radar showed that they were in the clear. And then they flew on to Saipan and landed safely. And the rest of the squadron, I think, got there the next day or within several days. In part two, we'll cover dive speeds, armor protection, some unusual features of the plane, and of course, more NACA information. Hopefully, I'll be able to finish this up in a third part. I'm not sure yet possible this is going to need a fourth part. Anyhow, please like and subscribe and consider becoming a Patreon supporter. Details are on the about page of this channel. Now here are the original charts from which I pulled the speed data and 
the form mentioned in case any specific aircraft fanboys are butthurt that I didn't tilt things towards their favorite airplane. I'll leave each one on the screen for 10 seconds or so. As always, have a great day, and I look forward to reading your comments below. Thanks.